Um, so I'll start by introducing myself and uh, give you guys an idea of what we're going to be going over tonight. Um, the topic, as you can well see by the graphics as well as the title, is uh, related to toilet training for kids with um, autism and developmental disabilities. I am Mendy Minhares. I'm a clinical psychologist here at Children's at the Autism Center. Um, and I'm an assistant professor in psychiatry at UW and also the director of our early intervention program. Um, so I primarily work with littler kids under age six or seven, I would say. Um, and my background is in behavioral intervention. So this talk will be very much focused on behavioral intervention type approaches for um, teaching toilet training, which if you're here, I'm sure you know is a pretty big deal for a lot of kids. Um, so maybe just to kind of get an idea of the audience, do you guys mind raising your hand? I'm guessing you're probably mostly parents. You wanna raise your hand if you're a parent? Anybody not a parent and maybe wanna just call out what kind of a person, what your role is? Okay, and I know you guys are grandparents. Yeah, okay. And up in the back? Uh, paraeducator. paraeducator, okay. Grandparent. Another grandparent, cool, love that. Um, any, hi there, how are you? Okay. Welcome. Um, another and, grandparent, yes. Yes, another grandparent, three grandparents, very cool. Um, anybody else who's not a parent? I'm a caregiver. Okay. Okay, and um, maybe we can just get a show of hands again so I have an idea of sort of like younger age group versus older age group because in this population of individuals, as you guys know, oftentimes kids go well past kind of the typical developmental window for potty training without being trained. So how many people are here on behalf of a child, let's say under the age of five? Okay, how about on behalf of older kids, like five and up? All right, okay, pretty even split, okay, all right. The good news is the strategies are about the same either way, um, but it just helps me to kind of know where people might be at in terms of how you might be approaching things. Um, so let's jump right in. So we are gonna talk about, a little bit first about toileting readiness, um, because people oftentimes have a lot of questions about that. Um, it turns out to do the, the kind of intervention we're gonna talk about, you actually don't have to have a ton of readiness, which is good. Um, because a lot of times kids who have developmental delays don't have a lot of readiness. Um, but we'll talk about some of those signs so you can kind of assess a little bit better where you're at. Um, we are gonna talk about a procedure. The bulk of our, of our discussion will be about a procedure called habit training. Um, and habit training is a behavioral intervention approach to teaching toilet training that is highly structured um, and heavily relies on behavioral intervention strategies. So it's very purposefully developed you know, in the way that it is or in the framework that it is because it's geared around teaching kids who have not learned from kind of the usual strategies that we use for teaching, you know, typically developing kids potty training procedures. Um, and oftentimes kids with autism and kids with significant developmental delays don't learn well from the typical kinds of strategies we use, like you know, familiarize kids with the potty and read stories about it and encourage them to use it and get them you know, into the idea. A lot of times this stuff doesn't work very well. So habit training is really geared around a more intensive approach. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting. There are some common pitfalls that occur, I would say, for somewhere between 60 and 90% of kids with autism and developmental disabilities. So we'll talk about what some of those are um, and kind of some, you know, once you've done initial training, what some of the next steps are and what some good resources are. So a lot of good stuff to cover. So um, I'd like to just talk a little bit at the beginning about some of the things that make potty training hard for kids with ASD. Um, one of the, the biggest sort of most obvious ones is the fact that many kids with ASD are more broadly developmentally delayed and, and certainly that interferes with their learning in all domains. But there are some things that are real specific to ASD and I think you guys can probably all quickly start to imagine what some of these are. But I think it's useful to go through them a little bit to sort of be able to frame them as potential barriers to, to achieving this goal of potty training um, and, and to get people, you know, sort of thinking about what kinds of things you might want to assess in terms of what your barriers might be. Um, so the first one that I think is pretty obvious is communication difficulty. You know, it's, it's difficult, for example, to tell someone that you need to go potty if you're having trouble communicating. It's also difficult for us to communicate to the child with autism 
you know, what the importance of going potty is or what they're supposed to do or, you know, all of that teaching is so verbally mediated in typical development. And when we have kids who might be more limited in their verbal capacity or nonverbal in some cases, um, that communication can really get in the way. So that's a big one. Um, literal communication is another one. And, and I, I like to bring this up right off the bat in the beginning because there's so many sort of innuendos around potty. It's part of what like makes giving a talk on toilet training funny at times because there's lots of humor that can be embedded. But you know, it's not something that we talk about in a very concrete way very well. We don't say that well to kids oftentimes. Like, you should poop in the toilet. You know, we say like, oh, you should, you know, whatever, like do your duty in the potty. And it's like, what do all those words even mean? You know, sometimes kids with autism need like really straight language. Um, so kind of thinking about what kind of a communicator you have, you know, that you're trying to work with is, is definitely an important piece. Um, sensory issues. There's actually a lot of sensory kind of stimulation and input around the toileting routine. Um, some of it has to do with bodily awareness, but some of it also has to do with being in the bathroom. Um, and, and I think people don't always think about what kinds of sensory experiences kids have in the bathroom and how those can be aversive um, and how those can interfere with a willingness to go in the bathroom or a willingness to sit on the toilet and how a lot of kids are actually fearful of the bathroom. Um, and in a very different way than typical kids. I think we think of, of anxiety around toileting in typical kids of like, I'm anxious to let my poop go and see it go down the toilet, for example. Um, and in autism, much more of what we see is like, I'm afraid of the sound of the flusher, or the bathroom is made of tile and it's echoey, um, or it has really bright lights, because of course we all like our bright lights when we're getting ready in the morning in the front of the mirror, right? Um, so there's a lot of sensory issues around being in the bathroom that can really get in the way. Um, on the physiological side, you know, kids with autism who have a lot of disruption in their sensory processing may have real disruptions in their awareness of the need to void. Um, they may not be very aware of what that feels like. They may not be very aware of how it feels different to have to urinate than when you need to have a bowel movement. Um, they may not be very aware of what it feels like to be wet, to actually like have an accident. Some, you know, a lot of kids with autism would just sit in wet pants or sit in soiled pants and be sort of like, well, okay, like and just, you know, sort of none the wiser. Um, and that's not always related to their delays. I think sometimes people think of that as like related to kids who are very cognitively delayed. And I think in autism, oftentimes it can be related to poor sensory processing. They're just not really sensing that input the same way that you or I might, where we think, oh, it feels terrible to have your pants be all wet, for example. Um, so a lot of stuff there to assess. Um, the sensitivity and the overstimulation piece, you know, relates directly to the being in the bathroom, you know, examples I was just giving. Um, thinking about need for routine. So one of the things that happens a lot when I start a potty training program is that we have a lot of rigidity around the way that the child is currently going to the bathroom. You know, it's like he will only, you know, have a bowel movement if we're at home and he's in the corner and he's facing this way and he has this object in his hand and he's, pose, you know, like standing like this. And, and that's the rigid routine. And that sometimes is actually the, the much bigger barrier to getting the child in the bathroom than actually like going in the bathroom itself. Um, so sometimes we have to sort of assess what are the current routines and are there things about that that are rigid that we need to try to shift in order to get the child, you know, willing to get on board with this new routine, which is going to the bathroom. Um, the good news is, is if you can shift it, then a lot of times you can build a new, more functional routine. You know, so if you can get kids to sort of understand, like, nope, the new routine, the new way we do things is we do this all in the bathroom and in the toilet then you're good. But making that shift is obviously the challenge. Um, motor planning problems can get in the way. You guys are probably aware that a lot of kids with autism will have um, low muscle tone, a sort of uh, difficulty with motor planning, difficulty executing gross and fine motor movements, so just simple things like getting up on the toilet or feeling sta stable on the toilet. You know, if you're a kid who has low muscle tone, it usually means you have poor trunk strength. And so, you know, getting up on the toilet and sitting down and then not having like arms like you do on a chair or feeling like you're gonna fall in, I mean, that can actually be much more disconcerting for kids who have low muscle tone than for typical kids who can kind of stabilize themselves and feel pretty good. Um, so, so that can be something to assess. Deficits and imitation skills can get in the way. I mean, I would say that one of the biggest sort of avenues that we use for teaching typical kids potty training is imitation. 
You know, we do all kinds of like, watch mommy go potty, watch daddy go potty, watch a video about a, pot, a cartoon going potty, read a potty book. It's all imitation. Um, and if, you, if you're not sort of getting from that, oh, I'm supposed to do what I'm seeing them do, that's a big deficit in our teaching methodology then. Um, we oftentimes have issues around anxiety, and those can be for a variety of reasons, related to sensory issues, related to rigid routines, related to just not wanting to venture into this new you know, area, not liking change. Um, so again, kind of assessing that and understanding what your barriers are. And then problems with generalization and maintenance. So you know, we do a lot of programs around the child will go potty at home, but nowhere else. They won't use a public restroom. They won't go potty at school. Um, and sometimes that's rigid behavior patterns or fear or anxiety, but sometimes it's a problem with generalization. Like I, you know, I understand in this context where, where this potty is at my house, sort of how to execute my routine, but I, I haven't figured out yet how to you know, begin and then execute, execute that routine in a different setting. So sometimes we actually have to teach across settings. Um, so when we get right down to it, there's quite a few you know, specific aspects of autism that can really be you know, affecting our potty training efforts. So, toileting readiness. These are pretty broad parameters. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them because, they, like I said, they don't have a ton of bearing for actually doing a potty training intervention like I'm going to talk about. Um, but these are some general parameters. Generally speaking, a chronological or a mental age of about two years is very helpful. Um, I mean, that's about the time that most typically developing kids potty train. It's about the time that kids show you know, enough bodily awareness. It's about the time that they have kind of the physical capacity for continence. Um, so that's useful. Certainly, I would say we've done potty training with kids who probably did not have a mental age of two years. Um, it's harder. It takes longer. It takes really a lot of consistency and a lot of diligent effort on the part of the adults. But I think you know, kids can be successful. Um, but un you know, having a sense for developmentally where the child is at would help you kind of predict how challenging it might be to execute the training program. Um, awareness is certainly helpful, you know, awareness of when kids are wet, awareness of what the toileting routine is, um, awareness of the feeling that they have to go before they're actually wet. Um, a lot of times kids will develop awareness of being wet, but they won't be able to sort of you know, back that up a couple steps and realize right before it happens, like, oh, what does my body feel like right now? Um, so, you know, assessing how much awareness you think the child has is helpful. The more they have, the better. Um, awareness is not a prerequisite for a program like I'm going to talk about, though. Um, and it's something I think that is important for people to realize because, you know, in a lot of sort of typical settings, like a typical pediatric setting, for example, most pediatricians, and, and rightly so, because there's guidelines about developmentally when kids are ready, most pediatricians would tell you, like, if the child isn't showing any awareness, they're probably not ready. And generally speaking, that's a reasonable recommendation. Um, but what we know from experience with kids with autism is sometimes they never show that awareness. And at some point, we're just going to try it, and we're going to see how far we can get them, because it makes a big difference in their quality of life and yours if they're trained. Um, and, and this program is really designed to be for kids who don't show awareness. It's part of what it's designed to do is to try to teach them awareness. Um, so, so that's an important factor. Physiological factors that can just sort of help you know, again, how ready they are. Do things like, do they go for periods where they're dry? Like, do you, you know, do you notice that their diaper is dry for a while and then that they fully void? You know, that sort of suggests like they're holding their urine and then they're voiding, um, as opposed to just going, you know, little bits at a time or sort of not really demonstrating a very good ability to hold their urine. Um, if you take their pants off, do they stay dry for a period? Like, would they not pee because their diaper was off? Um, do they wake up dry in the morning ever? You know, a lot of times kids will wake up dry in the morning and then pee right as soon as they wake up. And so actually they're dry all night. Um, regular bowel movements is another one. Um, and, and we'll talk more about this because having regular bowel movements is really, really key to teaching kids bowel training. So we'll talk more about this at the end. Um, and certainly motor skills. I mean, you know, we, they do definitely need to be able to sit up and they need to be able to get on the toilet. Um, it is definitely hard for kids who, you know, maybe have some other medical condition or some other 
um, you know, sort of physical factors where they're maybe less mobile or, or struggling. Kind of low muscle tone and sort of, you know, mild delays in motor skills it, we can work with, but when kids are really much more motor delayed, like sometimes I'll see kids who are six or seven and have, and have just learned to walk, for example, um, because they have other sort of medically complex issues going on. And I oftentimes will recommend that we don't train those kids right after they've learned to walk, that we wait a little bit while until their, you know, their motor development has, has progressed a little bit more. Um, so, and then medical is the last one. So just really making sure that before we start a behavioral program, you know, we're sort of approaching this from a teaching perspective. We're approaching it from the, you know, the angle of we're going to launch this very intensive program to try to teach you this skill. Well, we want to make sure that there's not any medical factors that are going to be working against our, you know, our efforts and or where our efforts are maybe sort of like directly in conflict with what's going on medically for a child. So we really want to make sure that kids are not constipated, which in autism is very common, um, because when they have painful bowel movements, it can be a huge source of anxiety. So then you get kids who don't want to go in the bathroom and sit on the toilet because they think sitting on the toilet hurts. And if you have a child with this, you, you know, like this, you know what I'm talking about. It only takes one time for a kid with autism to, you know, to remember something happened there that I didn't like, I'm never going back there again. You know, the fire alarm went off when I was in that building. I'm not going within 20 feet of that building ever again in my life. Uh, so we don't want that happening with your bathroom <laughs> because that is a very big barrier. Um, so constipation is a big one to be, you know, to really have a, a robust intervention for constipation if it's happened, and to be, you know, reasonably far out timing-wise from the most recent episode. So not to like have an episode of constipation where the child was in a lot of pain and then start toilet training the next week. I would say like start toilet training in a few months, wait, you know, a ways down the road. Um, also, you know, just to make sure that there's not any other medical reason for, you know, for any urinary or fecal incontinence and making sure that there's no, you know, possibility that we have UTI because then, of course, the child is going to feel like they have to pee all the time and or they are going to pee all the time and it's really going to be pretty, you know, directly in conflict with what you're trying to do. Um, I have had that happen and it's uh, when you realize like, oh man, that was the reason for all those toileting accidents. You really feel like it's a bummer because you've been doing all this intervention around accidents and then you realize like there was a physical problem causing those accidents and that's that doesn't doesn't feel like a very good outcome um so habit training we are going to talk about habit training and what it is so habit training is based on this glorious book from the 70s called toilet training in less than a day and this was written by Two gentlemen, Nate Fox or uh, Nate Azrin and Richard Fox, who are sort of diehard behavioral behavioral interventionists. Um, they are still diehards in the field. Um, this is a book that has basically endured. Nobody has rewritten the toilet training protocol for the most part. It hasn't really been like updated or modified because it really works. Um, and it's a very well research supported intervention because it's very structured, it's really straightforward, it's totally uh, like all the procedures are very laid out, it's very easy to take data and track progress and it really works well. Um, one thing I will say about this book so that you don't think I'm crazy if you buy it and read it is it's written in very much of a like 50s, 60s, 70s kind of mentality. So it says things like toilet training will be very nice for the family because the mother is probably home all day with the child and will be very frustrated by the fact that she has to change diapers. And when the father comes home from work, he will also be very frustrated because he will be tired from his work day, you know, and you're like, okay, all right. So that part you can disregard, but the procedures hold true. The procedures in the book hold true. Um, so what we do in habit training is kind of a combination approach of a set of procedures. Um, and, and I'll go through these in a lot of detail, but this is a list of what they are. Um, and this is kind of a like a boot camp style training, if you will. So, I mean, everybody's probably heard about potty training strategies where you kind of take a couple days and you really hunker down and you stay home and you do it. This is one of those kind of approaches. Um, so the different components are starting out with, with not having the child wear diapers anymore, and we'll talk more about that. So we're transitioning them into underwear and we're doing it cold turkey. Um, putting them on a toileting schedule. So, you know, setting up a routine where like every, usually somewhere between like 20 and 40 minutes, you're taking them to the toilet. Um, 
increasing their fluid intake and sometimes people are like well that's kind of a strange thing to do but it makes a lot of sense when you think about learning strategies or, or teaching strategies for kids because going to the bathroom i mean how many times a day do we all go to the bathroom three four five i don't know six at the most maybe and when you think about how many trials you need to learn a new skill six trials a day is not a lot i mean if you're trying to learn to you know i don't know play the piano six times of practicing your song and then you're done, it's not going to get you very far. If you're trying to learn to kick a goal with a soccer ball, kick it six times and then you're done, you're not going to, you know, it's going to take you years. Um, so the, the strategy behind increasing the fluid intake is to increase the frequency with which the child has to go to the bathroom. And the idea is to get something more like 20 trials in a day, to really be at a point where the child has to go to the bathroom very frequently so that you can practice what they're supposed to do. Um, and the learning goes up a lot when you do that. This is also part of why we only do it for a couple days because it's, this is not sustainable. Um, you, for one thing, by the end of the second day, you're not gonna be able to get the child to drink enough anymore. Um, but it's also just not a, you know, taking them every 20 minutes and all this frequency and intensity, it's not a sustainable pattern. So the idea is to do this upfront set of procedures for a couple days and then we sort of dial it back and maintain the parts that are sustainable, which I'll talk about. Um, rewards for successful, successful completion of toileting. So, you know, by increasing the fluid in, intake, we're increasing the probability that the child is going to go to the bathroom in the toilet. I mean, we're basically just increasing the, the, the probability that we're going to have a coincidence. That when I put you on the toilet every 20 minutes, one of those times, finally, you're going to go. Um, and that gives us the desired behavior. It's not a behavior that you can prompt otherwise. You know, if I want to teach you to touch your nose, I can take your hand and go, touch your nose. Good touching your nose. Here's a reward for doing that. And after a couple of those trials, you're going to get the idea, right? But I can't physically make you go to the bathroom. So I have to wait for it to happen at the right time and then reinforce you for it. Um, so we're trying to essentially create a lot of probability that the child is going to go in the toilet when you take them and then reinforce them for it so that they can, a little bit of learning traction can happen. And, and the idea is, is that once you get one of those, the probability is going to go up that you're going to get another one and so on and so forth until the child starts to kind of see the idea. Um, so rewards are a big part of the program. Um, dry pants checks is, a, is just what it sounds like. It's literally a procedure where you check the child's pants in between their trips to the toilet. And if they're dry, you praise them for it. So they kind of have the idea like, oh, that's the right thing. Peeing on the floor is not the right thing, um, which is what the next strategy is, is positive practice for accidents. So when a child has an accident, we engage them in a practice procedure. And I'll, I'll go through with you guys in detail what that is. Um, and you do these things for about two days, two to three days, I would say. Um, and then you dial back the fluid intake back to normal. You dial back the toileting schedule to something that's sort of reasonable for any child that's learning potty training, so maybe every 60 to 90 minutes, which is a much more sustainable schedule. And you do keep doing the other strategies. So you do keep doing rewards, for example, and, and scheduled trips to the toilet and so on. So we'll go through it in more detail. Um, so um, when habit training is appropriate to use is, first of all, just if you want to train quickly. I've done this with typical kids. It's great. They're in two days. They totally learn it. They're done. It works like a charm. So sometimes it's just, hey, we want to do it quickly. Um, and if the child is showing pretty good skills and they're showing pretty good readiness and you don't think they're going to be that hard to train, you might still want to do this just to get it over with. Um, so that can be one good reason to do it. Um, another good reason, and, and the rest of them kind of relate more to kids with ASD, so when a child hasn't learned from some of the, uh, you know, the typical strategies that we use, when they haven't picked it up from just you prompting them throughout the day or you trying to do a, you know, a, a schedule of sitting once an hour or something like that. Um, when kids don't have any awareness of, you know, of the need to, to void, this is the kind of strategy that's going to work. There's not a lot of other programs out there that are going to be effective when a kid is really not showing awareness. So kids who are older, who are maybe more impacted by their autism, who have not learned it yet, and are maybe struggling to learn a lot of different skills, this kind of a program can be really good for them um, because it's very systematic and very sort of intense and repetitive. Um, if a, if a child doesn't demonstrate any awareness of being soiled is, you know, same thing. They're not demonstrating very good, probably sort of cognitive capacity overall, if that's the case, if they're an older child who just doesn't have that awareness. Um, 
If a child is five or six and not yet trained, or if a child is you know, over five or six and has a mental age of between two and four, so if they're a, you know, a child who's quite a bit more delayed, um, again, this can be a good approach. It's, it's a systematic approach. It's really geared around kids who are struggling to learn with less systematic approaches. So what do we do to get ready? So when I, I give a toilet training class, it's like a series where I have a small group of families come in and they actually go do it and then come back and tell me how it went. And this is like where I spend the majority of that class is getting people ready. Um, because the, the biggest contributor to failure of that two days actually does not have to do with the child. It has to do with whether the procedures were executed appropriately and thoroughly and to the 110th degree. Um, so I always really try to set families up for success. Like I belabor it until they're just like, okay, we got it, we got it. Um, because it's so intense that you, once you start, you're not gonna be able to stop and be like, oh, whoops, we're out of underwear. Or like, oh, we ran out of reinforcers, we gotta go to the store. That's gonna sabotage like your whole day, basically. So, so you wanna really be ready with all your supplies and your game plan and who's gonna do the potty training and who's gonna help you when you're so tired that you don't wanna, you know, you can't stand to see another reinforcer or another accident on the living room floor um, and really be ready. And choosing an appropriate time to start is key to that. So, I mean, obviously, if you're here on behalf of a child, you're probably pretty eager to do this. Most people are. Um, and they want to do it right now. They want to, like, let's get it done. Or let's do it before school starts. Or let's do it, you know, over Christmas break. Um, and I think it's really important that the timing be appropriate. Because if it's not appropriate, if there's stressors going on, if you're moving, if, you know, whatever, that's going to sabotage your ability to be consistent. And I think it's much better, even if you've been waiting a while, I think it's much better to wait three months, six months, however long, and execute it really well than it is to feel like you have to do it now for some reason. Um, taking data is really key to your success with a, pro with a program like this. And the reason is because you're not gonna think it's successful while you're doing it. It's, it's a slow go for those first couple days and you're gonna feel like it's not working. If, you know, if the child has three accidents in the morning of the first day and two accidents in the afternoon and another one when you wake up in the morning the, the following day, you're gonna feel like it's not working. But if you, if you take data and you graph those, the first half of the first day was three accidents. The second half of the first day was two accidents. The first half of the next day was one accident. Well, guess what? That's a really nice downward trend in accidents. You're going to feel like you're up to your eyeballs in accidents, but the data are going to tell you that you should keep going as opposed to that you know something's not working. Um, so a, a really key component of taking data is having baseline data, understanding how often the child pees just under normal conditions uh, and how often they have a bowel movement, which the bowel movement one is usually easier because you usually really know when that happens. Um, the urinating is a little harder when kids are on diaper, in diapers because you know, it can be hard to know exactly when they urinated or when you change it, was that one pee or was that two or three peas? So it, it can be a little bit tricky, but figuring out some ways to kind of understand how many times in a day the child pees is really helpful. Um, getting the materials, and we'll talk about you know, what some of those are. Um, developing a plan for who's going to attend to the child. So when, when I say dedicated, that should be like bold, underlined, caps, you know, bright orange, because somebody has to be on the child. Um, when we talk about especially the positive practice for accidents, that's a procedure that has to be executed as soon as the accident occurred, like literally the second it's done. Um, and so, you know, if somebody's kind of like making dinner and watching and, oh, shoot, you pee, and I don't know if that was right now or if it was 10 minutes ago. If it was 10 minutes ago, you've missed the, the learning opportunity. Um, so, the, so one adult needs to really be dedicated to the child and following the child around the house, just really like toddler style supervision. Um, so oftentimes it, what that really means is two adults, somebody to give you a break, somebody to be the one who makes you lunch or goes to the store if you run out of something. Um, it's pretty hard to do this solely, completely by yourself. Um, and then having a plan for coordination across settings, which we'll also talk more about. But after your two days, obviously you're not gonna just send the child to school and be like, bye, good job on your potty training. School needs to know where it's at. You know, school needs to have an understanding of what needs to happen. So we've got to, before we start, we've, everybody's got to have a game plan for what's going to happen when it's done. 
So um, preparation is really key, in case you haven't gleaned that from the last slide. Um, so the, you know, I think the first sort of key component is just understanding the procedures in detail. So reading the book that was on the previous slide, there's also some other written materials that I have at the end of the presentation, but really understanding what your procedures are, making sure that we have medical causes ruled out, um, determining who's going to coordinate across settings. So, I mean, usually that's going to be one of the parents, but, you know, if we need to talk to school and if we need to talk to ABA therapists or speech therapists or daycare or babysitters or grandparents or making sure that everybody that has the child in their care the following week is in the loop about the game plan, um, contacting those people and having a game plan, preparing all your materials, data sheets, fluid, reinforcers, underwear, and we'll go through those, um, and just making sure that we have a, a good sense for mobility and dressing skills. So do you, you know, if the child has like buttons and snaps, and th those probably aren't the pants we wanna wear. If we need a stool to get up on the toilet, if we need a potty seat, all that kind of stuff. So the materials, what do we need? We need underwear. We need lots of underwear because the reality is how much laundry do you want to do simultaneous to doing potty training? You probably don't want to do it. You're going to at least want to be able to wait until the end of the day. Um, you can continue doing pull-ups at night and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you're going to, if you're just going to focus on daytime and you're not going to go for nighttime, pull-ups at night are fine. Um, but you want to make sure you have those too, obviously. An accessible toilet or potty chair, whatever you need to make your bathroom accessible and to make sure the child is comfortable, feels stable, can get on and off by themselves, and so on. Um, highly preferred rewards. The highest, the highest, like the, the golden nugget of rewards is what you need here. Um, and this is a place where I usually tell families, like, if you can stand it, pull out the stops, like buy the treats buy the candy, buy the stuff you hate giving your kids that really motivates them. This is two days, it's short, it's not gonna go on forever, it's a hard skill to learn, and this is the time to really just go for whatever those rewards are that are really gonna motivate the child. Um, in my intervention in all other domains, just to contextualize that a little bit, I, what I really focus on with parents is have, how they can try to find natural reinforcers in the environment. So how you can engage with your child in the activities that they're motivated by, for example, how you can make them talk you know, within play-based activities that, that you're both enjoying together. So I rarely go to like food reward type interventions, but this is one time when I totally do. Um, it's just, you need really, really high, high, high motivation. Um, Preferred liquids are important. If you're gonna to try to load the child with fluid, by noon on the first day, they're gonna be like, no thank you, all done. You know, I don't need any more juice or water or whatever their thing is. So if you have a variety and if you have, again, maybe some things you don't normally like to give them, like juice or, you know, kind of treats, you're gonna be able to keep them going with the liquid. Um, salty snacks will help the liquid situation also. So this isn't a very healthy weekend, but remember it's only two days. Um, but you know, so once they're waterlogged and they're, they don't want to drink anymore, how about some crackers? <laughs> it's, it feels a little bit evil, but like we're not doing it forever. Um, and again, it keeps them going. The other thing, you know, I said that, that the biggest sort of pitfall in this not working is if the strategies aren't executed consistently for some reason. The other pitfall that is really hard to overcome is if the child won't drink. Um, if you can't get the child to drink, I mean, you just, you know, you can't force that down them. Um, and, and they're not going to have the frequency of urination, then you're not going to get that high number of trials. So being sure that you can get them to drink is really key. Now that being said, I mean, in all my years of practice, I can think of one kid, and it was actually pretty recently, where it failed because he wouldn't drink. I mean, it doesn't happen that often, um, but it would certainly sabotage your situation. Um, data sheets don't skip the data it's really tempting to skip it because you're doing all these other procedures and you're like oh the data clipboard or the whatever it's so like it's in the kitchen and i'm in the bathroom and now it's one more thing i have to worry about but again you're you're not going to think it's working and so the data are going to be the key to understanding whether you should keep going or not um, and they're going to help you stay motivated. <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of demoralizing. I mean, it, you feel like you've been doing all this really intense work and then, at the, you know, the afternoon of the second day, the child has an accident and you're like, oh, it's not getting it. And you kind of start to feel tempted to give up. But if you have those data and you can sort of look at them in a way that shows you what the trends are, it's going to tell you like, no, I got to keep going. Um, 
Uh, some kind of an outline of the program instructions, I think, is very useful. So just sort of bullet points of, you know, scheduled trips to the toilet, rewards for toileting, positive practice. Helps you remember what you're supposed to do. It helps you convey that information to other people. Um, extra clothing is kind of an obvious one, but again, just making sure, like, don't start the weekend with none of the laundry done. Start the weekend with the dresser full. Um, if you want to use a pants alarm, you can. So this is a product that I have a website at the end where you can buy these kinds of products. So it's basically, it's just what it sounds like. It's a little device that you put on the child's pants. When they start to urinate, the alarm goes off. Um, and it helps you monitor accidents. It basically helps you do the positive practice really immediately. Um, I, I honestly don't have a lot of families feel like they need to use it. Most families just try to monitor the child closely. Um, but it is another you know, tool that could be useful. The, for kids with autism, the alarm is pretty loud, so it can be a sensory, like you also don't want the child jumping out of their pants because they're scared to death because the alarm is going off. That will definitely make them pee, most likely, so that's a little bit counter to our goal. Um, any items that you know need to be put in place to prevent a mess? Um, we're going cold turkey into underwear. And, and that kind of sounds horrifying to a lot of parents of young kids. I have two young kids at home. That sounds horrifying to me. Um, but there's a lot of reasons for that. And so, you, again, you want to be proactive. Like, if you have a beautiful couch with beautiful fabric, like, let's cover it up. Or if you have a gorgeous oriental rug, let's maybe even roll it up. Just kind of getting the house ready. Mattress covers, so on and so forth. Um, and any visual cues you might need. So any, you know, if you, if you think the child would benefit from a visual cue, like it's time to go potty, um, or steps in the potty, you know, in the potty routine, some of those kinds of things you would obviously want to prep ahead of time. Um, so I, th this, the main goal of this slide is to show you guys a couple of different examples of potty chairs. And it's usually, let's see if my little, it's usually this one that people have not seen before. Um, whether you do a potty chair or a, you know a toilet seat insert is totally personal preference. Um, the advantage of a, this is that then you don't have to transition them from that to that, which again for kids with autism that's just one more transition and one more change that you're going to have to implement that could be challenging. But some kids are pretty uncomfortable on the toilet, so if that's the case, it's certainly better that they pee in a potty chair than in their diaper. So that's you know that's better than nothing. This is a cool thing, though, where this is a toilet seat. The whole seat is what you buy, and that is attached to it. So you basically replace your current toilet seat with that thing, and then it just has a little flip-up deal that you can flip up when you need to use a toilet, and the child can flip down. So that's kind of cool. Um, I, uh, Amazon is a good place to actually buy those. Um, but also thinking about you know, a stool to access the toilet, a stool to access the sink, anything you need to make the environment comfortable. So what are we going to wear? We are going to wear underwear. Um, and the reason is because diapers work really well, right? When a kid pees in a diaper, it gets all nice and absorbed by that weird little creepy gel that's in there, right? And that's the point. And they can't feel it. Or at least they don't feel it until they've peed three or four times and it's really saturated. Um, and we want them to feel it. We need to build their awareness. So when I said this is a program that partially builds awareness, this is part of why. When they pee in their underwear, we want them to feel it. Um, and we want them to know that they did it and have good awareness of that. Um, so the other, the other piece about teaching kids awareness is you want to try to not let them sit in their soiled pants. So, you know, again, when they're in a diaper, they are going to sit in their soiled pants because you're probably not going to know right away. If they have an accident, you're going to know. But when they sit in soiled pants or in wet pants, it kind of habituates their response to it. It, it makes them actually less aware. Um, so we want them to have this kind of stark difference between dry, wet. Um, training underpants are okay. So what I mean by training underpants is like thick underwear, you know, those ones with like the quilted padding in the front, not pull-ups because pull-ups are just like a diaper as far as how they absorb. Um, but training underpants just kind of help a little bit with the mess, but they're still really wet and cold when they're wet, you know. Um, you can certainly do plastic pants on the outside if you're concerned about your household and the mess and so on. You know, the pl again, the plastic pants will kind of help contain it, but the child's going to feel really wet from the underwear. Um, pull-ups at night are okay. The day and the night are kind of two separate goals. 
Um, and what you want to do if you're going to do pull-ups at night is you want to put them on right before bedtime and take them off right when the child wakes up, like the second their little feet hit the floor when they get out of bed. Because you don't want them having an opportunity to run around the house in their pull-up and pee in it and basically do exactly the thing you're trying to teach them not to do, which is to, you know, to pee outside the toilet. If they're going to pee in it, you want them to be asleep, ideally. Um, so you try to just you know, make that like the last thing you do before the child goes to bed. Um, and then, I mean, I think this is obvious, but again, just thinking about easy access pants. No buttons, no snaps, no zippers, and especially no belts or tights. Those are the worst. Um, so the procedures. So um, we're going to provide the child with these scheduled trips to the toilet. Um, and when you do this, one of the things I think is really good to do is to think about communication. You're going to be doing so much prompting when you're setting up these procedures that oftentimes we don't think about how are we going to teach the child to tell us that they need to go pee. We're telling them that they need to go pee. And whether they do or don't, we're taking them. Like we're not really so interested in do you actually have to go. We're just going to take you. Um, but what you can do in this routine is you can create a routine where you say to the child, you know, it's time to go potty. Tell mommy or tell daddy, potty, or I have to go potty. Or if they're nonverbal, like have them give you a card. So that you're just building the communication behavior into the routine, even though you're essentially prompting them to do that, and it may or may not be true at that point in time. You're, you're sort of creating a routine of what should happen, and you're increasing the chances that they're going to independently initiate later. Um, you certainly want to remove any obstacles to self-initiation, so you don't want the bathroom door locked at all other times except when you take the child in. You don't want a toilet seat locking lid, you know, scenario. Um, you're going to schedule frequent dry pants checks. So dry pants checks are going to occur in between your trips to the toilet. So if you're going like every half hour to the toilet, maybe about 15 minutes later, you could do a dry pants check and praise for that. Um, like I said, you're going to reward successful toileting. Successful being defined as something goes in the toilet. So sitting on the toilet doesn't get a reward, or it gets a lesser reward. Um, and certainly praise is fine for sitting on the toilet. But the big, big, big reward, the golden nugget of all rewards, that something has to go in the toilet. Um, it doesn't matter how much. It doesn't matter if it's the teeniest, barely audible tinkle, but it has to be something. Um, because we want to reinforce the behavior that we're trying to elicit. Um, we're going to do the positive practice, which I'll elaborate on, and we're going to take data. So um, the, the idea behind scheduled toileting is, like I said at the beginning, so we're trying to just provide frequent opportunities for practice, and we're trying to increase probability that the child is going to go in the toilet. So usually what I tell families when they're starting out is the first like three hours is a bit of an assessment period. You don't really know how often they're actually going to pee in the toilet. Um, so you probably want to start with like every 15 to 20 minutes and then you know it, it, you're going to be taking your data of course so after like two hours you can look back and say okay the child you know is actually peeing about every 30 minutes so maybe we can back off on our schedule a little bit and we'll take them every 25 minutes so that we're going kind of right before the point where we think they actually are going to have to go pee um, but usually like at least one to two times an hour and sometimes more um, is uh, is a good starting point. Um, and of course, the frequency is you know, provided by the fact that we're increasing that fluid intake. Um, it's always a good you know, practice just to take kids after they eat or drink in general. Like if they sat down to lunch and they consumed a lot, just take them. Because that's also what you'll normally do. That's a, that's a routine that you would normally engage in once they were trained. Um, so I kind of already went over the second part. You know, prompt them, do you have to go potty or let's go potty, and have them communicate something back to you even though you're just totally prompting it. Um, if the child initiates, certainly take them immediately. You know, there doesn't have to be any like, oh, tell mommy, I have to, like, whatever they do, however they let you know, go. Because your whole goal is just get them to pee in the toilet. Um, and again, totally minimize those obstacles. So then we're going to reward them. We're going to hope, 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 and it will happen, I promise you it will, that they are going to pee in the toilet at some point. And sometimes they seem to have good awareness of that, and sometimes it seems completely coincidental. But it doesn't really matter because you've elicited the behavior that you're trying to teach, and you want to make sure that you reward the heck out of it. Um, so any successful voiding, social praise, lots of like, yay, you did, you know, like bells and whistles and three ring circus, whatever is motivating, um, and something tangible, you know a food snack, five minutes on the iPad, a, a prize box. You could, you know, if, if the child likes little toys and stickers or whatever, you can do that type of a prize box, whatever motivates them. I have a kid who potty trained for spoonfuls of frosting. 
you know, yeah, you did it. Here's a spoonful of frosting. Sounds gross, right? But you know what? She was 16 and she'd never been potty trained and the parents would have fed her frosting by the gallon. They didn't care. And now she's potty trained. So that was a big deal. Um, so it's anything, whatever. Um, and remember that the rewards are defined by the child. What defines a reward is not like, hey, we think this is cool. It's you're going to want it. They have to want it, not us. Um, so that's where like a spoonful of frosting, like it can seem gross, but if that's what's motivating, that's a reward for that child. Um, the reward needs to be really immediate. So this is also feels a little gross. The spoonful of frosting was delivered in the bathroom. The M&M will be kept in the bathroom because you can't have a delay. Um, if you have a delay, then the child's not going to connect, oh, it was the peeing in the toilet that I did that got me this. So it's got to be like as they're peeing or the second they're done. Um, it's got to be contingent. It's got to be really clear. If they didn't pee, they don't get it. And sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes they're not very happy about that because they're frustrated. They want the reward. Um, but if you give it to them anyway, their learning is going to be totally confused. They're, the messaging is you know if you sit on the toilet you get a reward well then the next time of course they're going to want it again because they don't know what they have to do to get the reward they think it's something else than what you're looking for um and the reward should just be really heavily emphasized it's a really key component so dry pants checks are totally simple like i said it's between toileting trips it helps avoid accidents and teach kids continence sort of like awareness of like yeah you're holding it good you're dry that's the right thing that's what we want um Feels a little strange because you are going to physically like draw their attention. There's no other topic that I talk about where I go like this as often as when I give a toilet training talk, right? But that's what you're going to do. You're going to draw their attention to the fact that they're dry. I mean, you, if you say good job being dry, like it could be you didn't spill your water while you were drinking. We need them to understand what dry we're talking about. Um, so, you know, have them feel their underwear, have them like your pants are dry. Be really specific in what you're saying to them. Um, they may not realize what dry is if their language is delayed. So, you know, your pants are dry, your underwear is dry. Be really specific. Um, praise them. Um, and you can use rewards if you want to. So you can, you know, usually I just have families do verbal praise. But if you want to do some reward, you can. But it cannot be the same reward as the one that's in the bathroom. And, and ideally, it should be a less desirable reward. We should have, like, the most desirable reward in the bathroom. Um, so something that's a little less motivating but still rewarding. And again, you can use the pants alarm like we talked about. So positive practice. Positive practice is the key in all of this, in my opinion. Uh, when I have families that have gone through this and they come back to me like three months later, six months later, and they're like, it's not working, he's totally regressed, it's a disaster. The first thing I ask them, are you still doing the positive practice? And usually what they say is, no. And when they go home and start doing it, the accidents go away. Um, so this is really, really key. It's also a procedure that seems a little weird. It's a very behavioral procedure, but it's not a very intuitive procedure. Like, there's not a lot of situations in like normal parenting where we do stuff like this. Um, so what you do is you practice immediately on discovering an accident. So the child had an accident, boom, we're on it because you're supervising them so closely, and they're gonna practice what they should have done. Um, so it's not meant to be a punishment, it's meant to be a teaching procedure. So usually I tell people like just, you know, state what's happening, like you had an accident or you wet your pants, we don't go potty in the living room or wherever, we go potty in the toilet, just verbalize the situation, but it's not a punishment, it's not you're in trouble, it's not you wet your pants again, oh darn it. It's just meant to be, we have to teach you what to do, like oops, you forgot, teaching opportunity. Um, some of the things you will read, so one of the manuals that, that I have listed on one of my last slides, some of the things you will read will tell you that you should actually kind of make this a reprimanding type of a procedure. Um, and what I find in actual practice is what doesn't work about that is that as soon as you start reprimanding the child, especially if they're young, they're going to start crying, right? They know they're in trouble. And then you're going to motor them through this fairly intensive practice procedure, which makes it just that much harder to get them to do it. So it just, I don't think that is a useful part of, the, part of the strategy at all. To me, I think what's important is doing, going through the motions of what you should have done. It's not the fact that someone's mad at you because you did the wrong thing. I don't think that enhances the learning. Um, so you immediately take the child to the toilet, and you can take their, you can like take the wet pants off. They don't have to practice in the wet pants. Um, but you have them go through the toileting routine. So you go in the bathroom, to, you know, take the pants down, sit on the toilet, 
We don't go potty in the living room. We go potty on the toilet. Maybe you count to five. They don't have to stay there for a long time. Um, and then you go back to where the accident happened and you reiterate the same thing and repeat. So back to the living room. We don't go potty in the living room. We go potty on the toilet. Let's practice again. Back to the bathroom. Pull down there now dry pants. So, you, so it's good to have dry clothes in the bathroom for positive practice so that you can, the, on the first round of practice, you whip off the wet stuff, you replace it with dry stuff. Um, we, we have to practice, we do it again. Three times is the goal. Um, again, a lot of the written materials will tell you five times. What I find with most kids is that you're doing good if you get them to three. The first time they're gonna probably be okay, the second time they're gonna balk, and the third time they're gonna be like, I am done with this procedure. Um, so if you can get them to three, you're doing good. Um, if you can't get them to three, like if their reaction is pretty significant, in terms of just not wanting to do it, two strategies. One is try to do it a few more times. Like the next time they have an accident, don't give up. Because a lot of times you'll kind of just create a routine that they come to realize they have to comply with and they stop resisting. Um, so, so that's sort of the first line approach to resistance is the next several accidents, just try to do it anyway. Try to, you know, just kind of motor them through the resistance and see if you can get them to comply and see if the resistance goes down. If it doesn't, at least try to get them through two because one is not repetition and two is repetition. Um, and, w and one, you know, instance of practice is pretty much what everyone does normally. Like your kid has an accident, most people take that child to the toilet and sit them down and say, this is what you should have done. Uh, but it's the repetition that we really need that makes it effective. So that's what we're going for. Um, and then just resume your toileting schedule. So you had an accident, okay, now we know we probably have about 20 minutes or whatever schedule you're on until we need to take you again. So data recording. So there's a few different data sheets you can use or you can make your own. I've had parents make their own because it makes intuitively better sense to them. Um, there's, there's apps for this now, of course. There's apps for everything, right? Um, when I was in labor, there's an app for contraction monitoring and it will graph your contractions, who knew? Um, uh -huh. So there's an app for tracking your potty schedule. It's called P-Plot, so you can look that up and download it. Um, but if you're old-fashioned like me and you like pencil and a paper because you can see it and really understand what's happening, there's lots of data sheets too. Um, so you do want to record your data right away. It, you're just you're doing so much. You're multitasking with so many components. If you think like, oh, I'll remember it and I'll record it in a little bit, you're gonna forget. Like, oh, was that the one where he did pee in the toilet or he didn't pee in the toilet? So you want to just like have it really conveniently set up. Either carry it around with you on a clipboard or tape it on the bathroom wall. Do whatever really works for you. Um, and then these are the things you're gonna want to record. The, the, most of the time and place, you're gonna know the date because it's only gonna be a couple days, but time and place, you know, so that you have a sense for how far apart the accidents are as you record them. Sometimes there's patterns in where they happen, so, so knowing the place is helpful. Um, and then whether it was a success or an accident, did they pee in the toilet or did they pee somewhere else? The type of voiding, was it scheduled or was it self-initiated? And then all trips to the toilet. You want a record of when you went to the toilet but the child didn't pee because that tells you when you should next prompt. Um, so you want that as well. And, and so taking the data really helps dictate your toileting schedule, like I was saying, within the first few hours. Because after about three hours of that intensive fluid intake, you can sort of look back and say, okay, we're actually peeing about this often and you can adjust your schedule. Um, most often what happens is you'll start on a pretty frequent schedule, like every 15 to 20 minutes, and you'll find you can back off a little bit, which for obvious reasons is nice. So, you know, having those data and kind of shifting is good. Um, so here's an example data sheet. This is from one of the manuals that's on the back. Um, and you can see it's just, you know, has a little key at the top. What was the place? What was the date? What was the time? If it was an accident, was it urine or bowel? So you just put like a U if it was a urine accident. If the child was taken to the toilet, was it urine, bowel, or nothing happened? So that way you know you took them. And if they self-initiated, was it urine or bowel? Um, so the little, you know, abbreviations are keyed right up there. Um, this is just one version. Like I said, there's lots, and I've had parents make their own. This is another one, which is a lot more open-ended, where it just has, you know, the time, um, and then some of the, the common things that happen. What I don't like about having set time is you're not gonna be on a schedule that's that set. You know, if you're on a 30 minute schedule, it doesn't mean that you're gonna go every 30 minutes on the hour. It means you're gonna go 30 minutes after they last peed. So when they have an accident, you know, at 7.15, you don't really need to go again at 7.30. You can wait till 7.45. Um, so you get the idea. 
Um, so then ongoing training. So you've done your boot camp. It's, it's like Sunday afternoon. You've been doing it all weekend. You're analyzing your data and you're seeing if you think it was successful. Um, you're not going to wake up Monday morning and just do nothing because really they've just barely learned the basic skills in those two days. What your goal is to teach in those two days is essentially to trip train them. And what I mean by that is that they understand I don't go pee until someone puts me on the toilet. They may not know how to initiate, they may not know how to communicate, but they know I hold my pee until I'm on the toilet. And they understand that they should not pee somewhere else. Um, so if you're, that's a really good sort of way to understand how close to the, like how good was your progress over the weekend. If pretty much they won't pee in their underwear anymore, or maybe it's one accident a day, which is I would say like probably the most common outcome is okay, now we're having about an accident a day or a little less. It's not gonna be perfect right after. Um, but the idea is for them to understand, don't pee unless you're sitting on a toilet. And, and even if someone has to take you there. So, so then we still have some work to do. Um, so then we will, after those couple days, resume normal fluid intake and back off our schedule of, of you know, trips to the toilet a lot. So, so this is where, again, you kind of have to look at the data to, to maybe sort of understand what your schedule should be. Some kids pee once an hour, some kids maybe pee every two or three hours. You wanna be on a schedule that kind of matches their frequency, but you are still gonna prompt. You are still gonna, gonna take them at those regular intervals. And you're gonna want people in other settings to take them. So you know, when the child goes to school on Monday morning, you're gonna want school to know, you know what, he, you do need to sit him on the toilet every hour. Um, and most schools, especially you know, schools of young kids, are pretty amenable to this kind of thing because they're toileting all the kids. I mean, all the kids need to go sit on the toilet every one to two hours and so a lot of times they have it built into the routine everybody goes and they maybe they sit on a bench or they line up and everyone has their turn and you know so it's oftentimes not that hard to get schools to kind of you know make sure they're doing what you need them to do um the uh this the um Oh, I lost what I was going to say. Okay, well, anyway. Um, so yeah, so you're coordinating across the settings, you're figuring out what your schedule is, um, and hopefully you've established that continence after the first couple of days. Um, so then, you know, as far as how you coordinate it, you, I mean, most of it's kind of intuitive, but you, you do want to sort of designate, I think, someone in each setting to take some responsibility. As much as schools are usually willing to put kids on a schedule, one of the pitfalls, I think, is there can be so many members of a team. There's multiple paraprofessionals, and there's you know, teachers and therapists coming in and out, and people maybe don't always realize, you know, oh, we told the teacher the game plan, but now the kid's in, been taken out by the speech therapist, and that person doesn't know the plan. So if someone in that setting can take responsibility, I think that's really useful. Then you don't have to make sure that you met with the speech therapist and every paraprofessional and every, you know, um, but you can, know, you can know that, okay, the teacher is really the one or, or my child's para is the one who's gonna disseminate this information. Um, obviously you need to figure out which settings you need to do that in and communicate that. Um, and I think it's good to have a meeting if you can. It can be hard to coordinate. So if you can't, then making sure that you just convey the information to everybody. Um, but if you can have a meeting, then everybody's on the same page. Because one of the things I find is hard is some of these procedures are not that intuitive, like positive practice, for example, it seems kind of weird, right? Like you're doing all this repetition and you go back to where the accident happened and you, you know. Um, so sometimes some of it gets lost, you know, it's like a game of telephone. <laughs> like by the time the teacher tells the para who tells the SLP who tells the so-and-so, suddenly positive practices, when the child has an accident, go in the bathroom and change their clothes. And you're like, no, that's not, you know, that wasn't it. Um, so it can be useful to, to have a meeting if you can get it coordinated. Um, and then to try to maintain that over time. Um, so teaching communication, I, I touched on this a little bit, uh, but I do think it's really good to think upfront about communication because it increases your probability that the child is gonna self-initiate. So as you guys probably know, one of the problems that kids with autism will commonly have is they get very prompt dependent. They get, you know, it becomes a routine and they don't realize that, oh, I could actually do this myself outside the routine. In their mind, it's just, this is the way we toilet. And so they wait for you to prompt and they don't do something different. Um, 
So teaching them some communication strategies up front is a really good way to try to, you know, give them some tools and sort of program in some tools from the get-go that will enhance the likelihood that they're going to initiate. Um, so if you need an alternative or an augmentative form of communication, that's great. Figure out what it's going to be and, you know, prepare it. It can be an object of some kind. It can be a picture exchange. It can be a printed word. It can be an app or a, you know, some kind of a visual cue on a device. Um, and then you really want to reinforce all attempts at communicating the need to use the toilet. Um, and even when the behaviors are not the desired communication behaviors. So if the child starts crossing their legs and, you know, whining or melting down, I mean, they are communicating to you. They are showing you, showing signs that they need to go. Um, and you want to really, again, give them the idea that any sign that we have from you or any behavior you engage in that shows us that you need to go is going to be responded to so that you're going to increase the probability that they are going to engage in that initiation type behavior. Um, if you are going to use a visual cue, it's important to think about something that can be available across settings. Um, so if the device, for example, if the child has an iPad but it's only at school, that might not be the best cue because now you can't do that at home. Um, so you want to just think, you know, is it easy for us to replicate and have in all settings? Um, and then you want to have it available in all settings. So I mean, I'll oftentimes talk to parents about, like, don't forget about when you're in public. What, you know, maybe you want to have that little visual cue, like on a ring attached to your purse or attached to the child's backpack or, um, but, but while also being discreet and not having it be something that might be embarrassing for them. But you get the idea. Um, so, um, you know, when we're teaching initiation, I think one of the biggest things we can do is prompting that communication behavior as part of the toileting routine and making it really easy for them to communicate. Um, sometimes visual cues are useful, even for kids who are verbal. You know, parents will say, well, my kid talks, so I don't need that. Um, but sometimes kids who, you know, and this happens really to all of us, like sometimes when we're stressed or when we're in a kind of a pressure situation, our communication isn't that good, right? So it may be that a very verbal child, when they feel like they have to pee, they get really stressed and all of a sudden they can't verbalize to you at that moment. So if they can use some kind of a cue, that can be useful. Um, reinforcing any attempts at communicating that they need to go really encouraging independence on any steps that don't need prompting. So like when you get them into the bathroom, if you know that they can do their own pants and get on the toilet themselves, back off, like encourage them to engage in all that on their own or whatever part of it they can. Um, and then don't require them to ask. And this one seems obvious, but this happens all the time <laughs> where the child will run into the bathroom and the parent will be like, wait, 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 do you need to go potty? Do you need to go potty? You know, and it's like, let them go. Let, if they're going to do it, that's great. We don't all ask every time we have to go potty, right? Um, and parents will tell me like, all of a sudden we, you know, we're eating dinner and we heard the sound of potty happening. And like the child will sometimes just go. And it's actually, I think, more common in my sort of like clinical experience for kids to start initiating the routine themselves than it is for them to start initiating the communication. Because the, the communication is sort of directly tied into some of the deficits associated with autism. Executing a routine is actually a strength of a lot of kids with autism. So a lot of times they'll just go in the bathroom, pull down their pants, get up on the toilet and do the routine. And they won't tell you that they need to go. But that's fine. Um, we want them to ultimately be able to do all things. They do also need to be able to tell you because if the toilet's not available, the best strategy for that is to ask someone, um, but we don't want to discourage that behavior of initiating the routine itself. So some helpful hints in troubleshooting. Um, I, so I already touched on this, but just really, uh, you know, to drive home that, that we're not reprimanding the child for accidents. And sometimes when you're frustrated, it's really hard. You know, you're just like, oh, not another accident. Um, it doesn't help their learning. Oftentimes it makes them frustrated and stressed, which all of us do, you know, are not as good of learners when we're frustrated and stressed and we tend to shut down. So we want them as available for learning as they can be in that moment because they need to learn what they should have done. So, you know, I think a reprimand just sort of like muddies the learning waters essentially. Um, positive practice, I already said, the more the better, but two to three times is a really good goal and really try not to stop because of tantrums. Um, how long you should stay in the bathroom is a question that people ask a lot because some potty training approaches are like camp out in the bathroom that's sort of a different potty boot camp strategy camp out all day wait for the potty to happen and then reinforce it and that can be fine um that can you know be a sort of a strategy that's incorporated in here where you're kind of hanging out and you're like i know you have to pee it's been like 45 minutes and you know 
Um, but you don't want it to be aversive. So it's fine if the child is fine with it. Maybe they're looking at a book or you guys are singing songs and it's perfectly fine to bring in whatever you need to bring in to make their time in the bathroom positive, as long as you're not giving them their reinforcer if they haven't peed. Um, but if they don't like it or if they're becoming avoidant, it's not going to be useful to try to force them to stay. Um, so usually what I have families do is, in, you know, instead of forcing the child to stay, go in, sit for a minute. If you need to, like, set a timer or make a routine out of singing a song or counting to 40 or whatever. Um, and, and then go. And even if you have to come back five minutes later, I think that's easier than trying to force the child to sit for a long period of time. Um, what you don't want to do is create an aversion where then all of a sudden you're having to drag them in for all their scheduled, you know, toileting sits because then the whole thing becomes really aversive. Um, it's good to make it fun. It's good to bring in preferred activities. Like I said, iPad, whatever, you, you know, music, bells, whistles, do a dance, do some cartwheels, whatever the child does to keep entertained. Um, and once the intensive training is complete, you know, you're thinking about being out in the community, people will sometimes ask me, like, what if there's no toilet? Well, bring a body chair with you if you need to. Like, do whatever you need to do to facilitate their, you know, their success. One family asked me one time, what if I, what if I pull over on the side of the highway and I get a ticket for, like, I don't know, child nudity or something, you know? And I was like, if that happens, you call me back and I'm going to write you a doctor's note that I prescribed that you have a potty chair in your trunk. Because, you know, I mean, you're trying to do right by your child. So troubleshooting some common pitfalls. Um, generalization to new locations is a common one. So they're good at home, but they won't do it at school. They're good at home, but they won't do it in public. So first, just making sure you know why they won't do it. Because oftentimes in public, it has to do with fears. Um, there are a few things about public restrooms that are particularly anxiety provoking for kids who have sensory issues. Hand dryers, loud flushing toilets, echoey big tile covered rooms, but also unpredictability. I don't know when the person in the stall next to me is going to make that loud noise that I don't like. Um, so assessing what it is that is creating the problem is our first key. Because if it's one of those things, it's a very different kind of a problem than just like, I don't understand that I could also execute this routine in another setting. If it's more just I haven't transferred the routine to another setting, then doing the procedures that you did at home in another setting is, is what's going to be useful. And you don't have to go do like two days at the mall with intensive, you know, giving the child fluid. But, you know, like making sure that you practice every time you go to the mall, making sure that every time you go to a restaurant, you go to the bathroom a couple times during dinner, like really just trying to work that into your routine. Um, if it's some of the sensory stuff, sometimes the interventions get a little bit more complicated around trying to get kids used to those, you know, those sensory stimuli. Um, a question that comes up a lot is standing versus sitting for boys. So usually what I recommend is that if the child has not already shown a preference for standing, that you do sitting. Because figuring out whether I need to stand or sit based on my bodily sensation is like a whole other level of complexity. I feel one sensation, which means I have to pee, which means I should sit versus I feel, a, you know, or stand versus a different sensation, which means I have to poop, which means I should sit. Like, it, that's a whole complicated thing, right? So if the child hasn't already shown a preference, do the whole thing sitting. You can get that little potty guard on your uh, on your little potty seat so that when they pee, it doesn't go straight out, that it does actually go in the toilet. That helps. Um, here and there, there's a child who is already showing some, you know, sort of propensity for standing or for using urinals. Um, and in those cases, I'll usually tell parents, like, if you think that's going to increase the probability that they learn this procedure, then go with it. Because bowel training is also usually something that kind of lags behind anyway. So if you think you can get your child to pee in the toilet and be trained to do that by having them stand, then I think that's, a, you know, a reasonable approach. Um, these are a couple of products that are, uh, I actually had never seen this. Has anybody ever seen this? You, do you have it? Oh, how funny. <laughs> I've never seen that. That's like the most genius thing for teaching a kid with autism to pee in a urinal. It's like, I mean, you can see it just like sticks to your bathroom wall and boom, done. Like lots of opportunities for practice. Yeah. And ours actually has a little wheel that when the screen hits it, the wheel Oh, it. So wow. Mm-hmm. And it's shaped like a phone. My five-year-old daughter is very excited about it. She's at six. <laughs> she can't use it. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's, I'm glad I know that. That makes it even better. Um, so 
So yeah, so if you are trying to teach peeing in a urinal, if you're gonna do standing at home because the child wants to stand, I would do it in the toilet because that's the procedure they really need to know. But if you're specifically trying to teach peeing in a urinal, well, that's one way you could get a lot more opportunities for practice. Um, if you guys haven't seen these kind of products, it's basically just teaching kid boys to aim in the toilet. Like the goal is not just to like stand in this place and pee. That's what you do when you're having an accident, right? The goal is to pay attention to where you're peeing and to get it in there. So lots of lots of products geared around that. You can also just use Cheerios if you want to be like you know old school '70s style. Um, but either way. Um, so when bowel training lags behind, this is a big this is a big one, and I would say this is more the norm than not for kids with autism for lots of reasons. Um, the very first thing to do is to rule out constipation because so many kids with autism have constipation. Some of the recent statistics are as high as 90% um, when people have looked at, at clinical populations. So we wanna really make sure that the child isn't constipated because we're already talking about a behavior that probably only happens once and maybe twice in a day. And if you're constipated, it happens like every few days or in some severe cases, once a week, or I've even had kids go as long as two weeks without pooping. Um, and that's like zero learning trials. If you only poop you know, twice a week, you kind of might as well not be having any learning trials at all. You're not gonna catch on to what you're supposed to do. Um, not to mention that constipation is not good for you physically. But um, so if the child does not have constipation and they're regular, their bowel movements are normal, you're fine, you're not worried, then you're gonna do all the same behavioral interventions. It's just probably gonna take longer because your number of learning trials is so reduced. Um, so when you think about like 20 in a day versus one or two in a day, well, of course this behavior is gonna lag behind. It's, we're hardly getting any trials in. Um, so you know, trying to take the child to sit on the toilet when you think they have to poop, if you know what time of day they're likely to poop, sit them on the toilet at that time of day, um, reinforcing them when they do, even if it's a teeny tiny bit, doing the positive practice for the accidents, and I actually think that's the most key thing because that's the one procedure where you have an opportunity to show them what they should have done when they poop away from, you know, outside the toilet. Um, so just basically doing all the same procedures as long as they're not constipated. If they are constipated, then oftentimes a combination of laxatives and a behavioral intervention. And so when I say laxatives, we're not like trying to clean them out, although you might need to clean them out initially, but we're trying to create regular bowel movement. So working with your pediatrician around a regimen of something like Miralax that can be given every day, that doesn't cause a lot of intestinal discomfort, and it's safe for use over time to keep them regular. Um, dietary changes certainly are, you know, or fluid, in increasing fluid intake, but intervening on the constipation will become a key. Um, and the data are kind, of, uh, are kind of inconclusive, actually, about what the best approach is, um, but do definitely support um, you know, both the use of laxatives to try to create that regularity as well as the behavioral interventions. Um, nighttime continence is another one. So uh, this is what usually happens at my house. I don't know about your house, but <laughs> the kids are awake, but I'm asleep. Um, so there's a lot of common approaches, you know, reducing their fluids after dinner. Um, you can wake them up at night as long as they're an okay sleeper. Most kids, you can wake them up, motor them to the toilet, sit them down, they'll pee, take them back, they fall asleep, they're none the wiser. If they're a disrupted sleeper, which a lot of kids with autism are, you might not want to do that. Um, oftentimes waiting, so what's interesting is when people have looked at the at data on this over time, it's actually not that clear whether interventions for nighttime continence are any more effective than waiting. Um, because most kids will hit a point developmentally, as long as they're trained during the day so that we know that they have the capacity for training, most kids will hit a point developmentally where they become dry in the morning. Um, and one of the things that is really useful to check for is when they wake up, a lot of times you're not even aware they're awake or you know, maybe you don't get out of bed the second they wake up, they come, finally come you know, into your room or whatever. And oftentimes they will have woken up dry and then peed in that little window in their pull-up. Um, and so in fact, they were continent at night and they peed in the morning. Um, and so sometimes you know, to assess where you're at, setting your alarm to get up 10 minutes before your child wakes up and checking to see if they're dry is really useful. Because if you find they are, well, you've met this goal. Um, 
If they're not, or if waiting for a while doesn't work, then there are some other things you can do. But I usually have families wait like six to 12 months after the initial training during the day before they start any major nighttime interventions. You can start you know, waking them up once at night if you want to or some things like that. But before you do something like the bell and pad or the pants alarm, I think just waiting to see if kind of developmentally they, they show readiness is, is useful. Um, so what the data show is that the most effective intervention for nighttime training is this kind of a this kind of an approach. So using a pants alarm or a bell and pad, which is the same thing as a daytime one, where when they start to pee, it wakes them up. Um, and it wakes you up as well. And the importance of you being up is that you need to attach the toileting routine to the fact that they have just started to pee. So the teaching occurs when the child wakes up, realizes they're wet, or realizes they're in the act of peeing, and you take them to the bathroom. Um, you then can reinforce them for going to the bathroom. And oftentimes what happens is that the child learns through that process, their awareness kind of backs up in that chain of events. So initially they're not aware until they've woken up wet. And then you know they'll start to become aware maybe like right when they start to pee. And then they'll start to become aware right before they pee, which is key. That's your goal. Um, so, so what the research shows is that if, as long as you execute the toileting routine with them when the alarm goes off, um, that, that typically kids will learn that routine. Now, of course, there is those kids or are those kids who are super heavy sleepers who you're going to do all these interventions and it's, they're still not going to be trained. And there are some pharmacological approaches that you can work with your pediatrician or if you have other you know, medical providers related to the child's autism treatment. Um, there's two medications. One is called amipramine and one is called DDAVP. Um, they're pretty effective, although it's, you know, it's a range of effectiveness, but they have a high rate of relapse, meaning they don't really result in training. They just result in sort of a biological dryness. Um, so sometimes combining these things with other interventions or, you know, using them for a period of time and then sort of seeing has, has the child developmentally sort of become more ready. Um, sometimes people will use, especially DDAVP, uh, short term, like if the child's going to camp and it's just socially stigmatizing for them to wet the bed, just make sure they don't wet it for a week and that's fine. We don't care if they relapse when they get home because we know we're still working on this goal. Um, but these can be some other things you can do. So here are some resources. Um, this is a, a little manual that can be ordered um, through the UC Santa Barbara Autism Center. It's just like a tiny little pamphlet. It's like five or six bucks. Um, it's the manual that has a few things in it that I don't do, like the reprimanding and the, um, you know, sort of being negative about the accidents, that kind of stuff. But it generally contains the procedures. This is the book that we mentioned. Um, this toilet training for individuals with autism or other developmental issues is a a book that has a broader range of strategies and also a section on habit training. Um, so it can be a nice general resource and it has a lot of ideas for visual cues and problem solving and addressing sensory issues. And, um, and then uh, this is a practice parameter from the um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry about the sort of the treatment of these issues if they're ongoing. There are some toilet training supply companies. The Bedwetting Store, it turns out, is, a, is the name of a supply company, but they have all kinds of things. This, has anybody seen this? This is my other new discovery. I was, I was looking for, I forget what I was even looking for, but something related to supplies for toileting, I was like, what is this? But it's exactly what it looks like. It's a potty chair with an iPad built in. And for kids with autism, that could be a really good thing, potentially. So that's something cool to know about. Um, medical supply companies can also be a good resource, particularly for older kids who might need some adaptive supports, like you know, some kind of a framework around the toilet to feel stable, that kind of thing. Um, so those can be good places to look for, for supplies if you're not you know, just looking for the typical like little potty stools and potty seats and stuff if it's a larger child. Um, oh, let's see. This um, I like to show just because we typically think of just a stool, but sometimes for kids who can't step up on a stool without holding on to something, it can be nice for them. I mean, it's obviously it's like a little ladder, so they have something to hold on. And if nothing else works, you can do this. I'll read it to you guys to make sure everyone can see it. After trying for weeks to get my son to use the potty, I finally get into straight up bribery, which is sort of what some of this is about, right? So we have cute undies. I explain to my son that the bladder holds pee and the intestines hold the poop and they go in the potty and the potty says, yay. We up the ante on candy rewards, tic tacs for pee 
M&Ms for poop. We demonstrate that VIP stuffed animal Froggy uses the potty with some rather deceptive tactics by sculpting a cliff bar into a pretty convincing turd. Sorry for the not so nice terminology. And sorry, cliff bar. Then we sneak the cliff poop into the toilet to show how Froggy pooped. And after a few days of struggling and a few poops on the floor, he finally gets the M&M. If it was that easy, then I wouldn't need to give you guys a talk. But you know what? If, I, if all else fails, you can try the cliff bar method. So with that, I will say thank you and, and good luck. And I will take questions. Perfect. So if you have a child that's visually impaired, would you have any suggestions? Oh, um, so I mean, I think the biggest thing to assess, so the question was, um, if the child is visually impaired, then what would be some other suggestions? So I think the biggest thing to assess is the child's mobility like how it affects their mobility and their awareness of their surroundings, which you're probably acutely aware of anyway, because it affects everything, not just toileting. Um, so, you know, if you're using other strategies for them to find their way in the house, you know, I don't know if you're teaching other strategies like tracing along the wall or other cues that they can use in the environment, um, I'd probably do all those same kinds of things. Um, I, would, I would try to do the strategies all as consistently as you can still, Obviously, you're not going to use visual cues, but you can try to use, is the child verbal? Yeah. So you can try to, you know, have them engage in some verbal communication, like prompt them to say potty and, you know, rather than like giving you a potty card, for example. Um, I think what is, would be most difficult in that situation is unfamiliar environments. Like then that child really does have to learn more initiation behaviors, um, which, you know, I, I mean, they're, like if they're at school, for example, and it's harder to navigate down the hall and da 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 to the bathroom. Like, oh, excuse me. Um, they really do have to learn how to, you know, let someone know that they need that assistance. Um, so, I mean, I think those are some of the things that come right off the top of my head. I don't know if that, those are helpful suggestions, but yeah, I think you have to just think about the environment. Um, yeah. Mm hmm. Oh, lots of questions. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, so my child is. Um, he's seven and, and a half, almost eight actually. And we've done the whole gamut of, of the boot camp and all of those strategies yeah. and they're done that. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are still having issues um, with um, the, the poop and the pee, you know, little tiny, he'll pee just a little bit, uh -huh. you know, so there's always going to be a little wet spot or we'll have like skid marks, you know, once or yeah. twice a day. Um, the biggest issue that I'm, I'm really struggling with is his initiation or, yeah. you know, verbally or any other way of telling, uh, you know, the caregiver or teacher or, or at home. Yeah. We've tried the visual cues or like iPad stuff, you know, you can't really carry that. So it's not really I know. practical to carry yeah. all that stuff around. So currently we're trying to teach him the um, the ASL sign for oh, like uh -huh. I have to go kind of yep. thing. And we, I mean, you know, nothing's kind of working. Nothing so has I'm, stuck. It's just, yeah, very yeah. frustrating at this point. I mean, I do like the idea of using a sign because it is with him at all times, right. obviously. I mean, I think that's a good, that's a, a really important consideration when you're using any kind of you know, visual cues or kind of alternative or augmentative communication. I mean, I think broadly across all, you know, sort of areas of intervention that I do, I think one of parents' biggest struggles with any kind of augmentative communication is access to it and kind of the fluency with which you can use it because it's not like you have the Velcro thing stuck to your hip, you know. Um, so, so, I mean, I think the sign is a, good, is a good thing to try. Another thing that I'll sometimes try that it doesn't really solve the problem that I just stated is that you can try posting the visual cue like everywhere, like how you know, have it up on the wall, like one in your kitchen, one in your living room, one in your hallway, one on the bathroom, one on the bedroom, you know, so that like anywhere the child turns, it's right there, and they could just grab it. Um, it's still like very limited to the home setting and not very generalizable, and but sometimes you know. It, it almost might be good to like try the sign for a while because that would be a much more generalizable strategy 
and see how that goes. And if that didn't go anywhere, it would be better to have a strategy that worked at home, even if that wasn't generalizable, for example. So you could try some other things like that. So we're still on a schedule both at school and home. Mm -hmm. So like he's taken, taken to the bathroom every hour. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, I, I sometimes feel that maybe that's kind of enabling him to not make that initiation. So you make a really good point, actually, because I definitely have had that happen where and particularly with older kids um where you know what we have found in fact and it can be hard to sort of tease it out especially if accidents are happening like sometimes you have to do it for a good chunk of time like a few weeks or a month um but where we have definitely figured out that when we back off the prompting that actually the initiation behavior goes up and the accidents go down because the child really becomes more responsible for the whole thing and their awareness of it improves a little bit and they're, you know. So the frosting girl actually, where we were given the spoonfuls of frosting, she was in high school and I mean, she had a big staff of a bunch of paraprofessionals in that classroom because the, you know, the, the kids in there required a lot of support. And so people were just taking a right and left, particularly because it was really, they were pretty averse to accidents happening. They were really trying to prevent accidents. And we would look at the data and be like, oh my gosh, well, no wonder she's not initiating. There's no time for initiation. Somebody's constantly like taking her. So we had them back off and they were pretty, you know, kind of tenuous about that. But in fact, her initiation behavior improved a lot. So you could try that. So should we like slowly back off or just like go completely cold turkey? Or? You know, we, in that particular case, I mean, I think it's probably on a case by case basis, but in that particular case, we backed off some but across the board. So what I mean by that is, you know, if they were taking her every, I don't know, 45 minutes, we like doubled it. Like we, it was a pretty big shift. We made them take her like every 90 minutes. Um, but then they did really take her every 90 minutes. Like they didn't back off completely, but they just left a lot more room in her day, you know, in between those scheduled trips to the toilet for her to initiate. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, we went from 45 minutes to 55 minutes. We didn't fade it, which you could do. I mean, you could sort of do more of a fading procedure where you like go to 55 minutes and do that for two weeks and then see how the child's doing and then go to 60 minutes and do that for two weeks and then, you know, increase. But instead of doing that kind of a systematic fading, we just like doubled the time frame um, because we, she had done it in the past and we knew she could do it and we were kind of like something's wonky with the new school year and this particular setting what's going on so we just kind of went for it to see what would happen and in fact it was successful but it's i couldn't have predicted that you know going into it i was as you know unsure as everybody else on the team was and we just tried it um but it's a good thought someone else has a yeah go yeah, ahead yeah um so we have been pretty successful in getting our eight-year-old potty trained after about five years of potty training purgatory. Congratulations. And, we um, should all give you a round of applause. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we're not at the complete independence area yeah. yet. Um, and we, we used a lot of the techniques that you outlined by trial and error. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it took so long was there was encopresis, and I uh -huh. can only attest that you got to treat that first, which you that's severe totally constipation. Do. Otherwise, yeah. your potty training efforts are just not going to work at yeah. all. If I can actually interject one thing related to that that sometimes people don't realize is that will also sometimes actually sabotage your urine training because oh, a very yes. full bowel will put pressure on the bladder and or when kids are trying to squeeze out a bowel movement that's hard to get out, they will pee. So when, you, when you're in that zone and you're trying to like do the potty training but not the bowel training because the kid's constipated, the whole thing can go south. So yeah, okay. you're, you're bringing up a good point. So it's been about a year now that we've had continence. And the problem I have now is that he just loves the reward so much. Um, he, he gets iPad time at home. Gotcha. And he will just hold it all day long at school or daycare <laughs> or you know, He's refuses to go anywhere. Yes, yeah. yes. And then when we are at home, he wants to go every hour. Yeah. Some and kids will he, go every five minutes. And yeah. And I yeah. just go in the room and say, your time's up now. And he'll squeeze something else. I still have to be here, mom. Uh -huh. And and so how do you decondition that expectation of a reward when it's yeah, been there for totally. five years? Yeah. So are you, does he get the iPad while he's on the toilet and so he stays in there or he yeah. gets it 
after he goes for a set period of time. Yeah, it, it was given to him originally just to sit on the potty, and that's gotcha. how it's stayed yeah. in okay. practice. Yeah. So now he's like staying in there for an hour saying, no, I have a little bit more. He, little he bit would, more. he would if you let him, yeah. yeah. Okay, so what do you do right now to get him out? Well, after five minutes, I say, your time's up. He says, give me another minute. So I give him another minute, and then I count to 10, and he's got to turn it off. Okay. And, um, and then when can he go in again? Like when is a reasonable period of time for him to go in again and do that again for five more minutes? Um, well, he, we usually go after eating because there's the gastrocolic reflex that, you know, when you eat, you, you usually poop after it, especially if you're on medications for encopresis, mm -hmm. which he still is on. So he's on high dose laxatives. Mm -hmm. And something you'll usually come out you know, he's the type of kid that would have five or six bowel movements a day because uh -huh. he's on yeah. so much yeah, medicine totally. for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't let him go more than once an hour okay. at home. But even if I do, he, he can squeeze something out each time. And, you know, especially at the end of a long school day, there's so sure. much is built up. That yeah, sure. He can do that. Um, so one thing you could do, he probably would resist the shift, but you could try, is, and this is a good way to fade reinforcers in a lot of cases, is you can start making the requirement be that he has to go more than once before he gets the iPad. So like a little bit of a sticker chart token system type situation. So, you know, okay, you get the iPad, whatever, at X point in the day, if you've gone to the bathroom three times or something. So then he's not getting okay. it every time, he's getting like one concentrated period of time if he kind of earned it as a reward. And usually the best way to do, I mean, it's better usually to kind of fade that gradually as opposed to just saying like, now you have to get five stickers and then you can have it at the end of the day. So wh what I mean by that is if right now he gets it every time, you could start by saying, now you get it every other time. So the first time you get a sticker or a point and the next time you get the iPad the next time you get a sticker or a point, and the next time you get the iPad. And then you could, you know, once he's used to that, then you can say, okay, now you have to get two stickers or two points, and then you get the iPad. So you're kind of gradually fading that out. And then you might be able to get it to a point where it's like, generally speaking, if you did a good job going to the bathroom today, you get a little bit of iPad after dinner or something. Something that's, oh, something that's a little bit more of a normal, you know, system that you might use for a range of behaviors with kids for doing a good job with stuff. Um, so that can oftentimes be a good way to, to fade it. You can also do things like fade the amount of time. Like, you know, normally you're getting five minutes, now you get four. Um, but he's already getting a decently short period of time. Like, that I think is more effective if it's like the child gets an hour and they're really resistant to that. And so we're going to fade it to 45 minutes and then 30, you know, down to smaller increments. Um, do you think he needs a reward to go to the bathroom? Probably not. I mean, when, when you have a kid with encopresis, you always worry, oh, gosh, they just can't get backed up again. Otherwise, right. we're in square one. So, yeah. So I think that's I'm, part of the question. He's kind of got me. <laughs> yeah. I think that's um, part of the question, too, fair. is sometimes when you fade the rewards too fast or if the child is sort of so used to a routine that when you fade it, they regress, like sometimes you want to be careful with that. Because, I mean, you could, if you just think like he's just used to the routine, but he just doesn't you know, he doesn't actually need the reward. He wouldn't regress if he removed it. You could basically go to some kind of a sticker system like that with the goal of just getting rid of it, you know, of just not doing it. But you definitely would not want to see him regress, especially because the constipation is has much bigger implications. So you'd probably want to tread pretty lightly on your fading, you know, on your fading process. Does that make sense? Yeah. One thing I will say about fading rewards, because people do ask that a lot, is... Um, a lot of the time what happens when kids learn these behaviors is they they kind of start forgetting to ask for the rewards you know it's like after a while they're going to the bathroom they don't ask for their treat or their thing and and parents are like well he's not asking so we're not giving it is that bad and that's not really bad as long as they don't regress you know that's natural fading essentially so usually i tell families like just keep reinforcing for a while like a few months and at some point the reinforcers are probably going to fade themselves naturally and go with it and as long as you don't see a regression. Um, because if you don't, then great. And if you do, then just step it back up. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's okay. helpful, but yeah. 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 But I agree with you, tread lightly. Like be, yeah, kind of be careful with fading. 
I know we're over time. Do you want to keep? I'm happy to keep taking questions if people want to. I'm, yeah, I'm fine. If anybody needs to go, we are at our past our stopping point, so we won't feel bad if you need to go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So you touched on this a little bit at the beginning. My granddaughter is six years old, and she's lagged behind on the bowel movement training. Um, but what she does is exactly what she talked about. She has a very specific routine. She's fairly regular, so yeah. um, she's not constipated, but she, ha she has to have a pull-up on. She has to go in the other room. She has to assume a certain pose in order to go. Uh -huh. They've tried withholding the pull-ups, and that will lead to her being practically sick because she will hold it she for days it. Yeah. Um, okay. until she has her routine in place yep. in order to go. Yeah, so it's really common. It's really common. I think it's the most common problem we have with bowel training when kids aren't constipated. So your goal is to break that rigid routine. Um, and you've already tried just flat out breaking it. I mean, that's what withholding the pull-up is. And that's usually what I try first. Uh, because some kids will, you know, withhold for a day or two and then they'll go. And that's usually fine. But I have other kids who will withhold for a week. Like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Like they'll practically be sick or they will be sick. Yeah, she's um, sick. Yeah. So, so we, we don't want to do that. Particularly because that can lead to constipation. <laughs> right. Um, so what we then have to do is... Oh, sorry. We're getting some feedback from... Is it turn off the mic where in Everett? Everett. Folks? Everett has a question. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, we no, we're not quite done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we will take the question from Everett if you guys can are tracking what I'm saying, but we're going to finish this question. Um, so what we usually try to do is sort of a different kind of a, a shaping or a fading procedure where we take whatever the child is doing and try to slowly morph it into what we want. So what I mean by that is to, to try to sort of break it down into some baby steps and see if you can shift the routine slowly. Like if the child has to go a certain place and assume a certain pose, could you get her to wear the pull-up and go in the bathroom and assume that pose, for example? Because at least then she's in the right room. Like that's a step in the right direction, you know? And, and if you could get her to do that and she wouldn't withhold, well, that's step one. Um, step two might be, can you get her to stand next to the toilet? and do her pose and go, you know? Step three might be, could she change her pose and actually sit on the toilet, even with the pull-up on, just sit down. Yeah, we tried to jump to that down. one and that didn't work, but we didn't do the step approach. Yeah, sometimes doing the, the kind of like the, this shaping procedure where you're doing all these baby steps makes a big difference. And a lot of times kids are not comfortable sitting down, like if they're used to standing up, they don't know how to physically kind of make that shift to getting, actually getting the bowel movement out when they're sitting. And I have that happen a lot. I think that's um, part of the problem, yeah. So sometimes if you can get them to practice sitting just in their pull-up, sitting on top of the toilet, it can even be with the lid closed if she's not comfortable, but just sitting, um, that can help. There's also some ways, if you know, especially if kids are squatting, like sometimes kids will squat but not sit. Yeah, she goes um, on all fours. She goes down on all okay. fours. Okay, okay, so that's actually a little bit harder one. Yeah, because sometimes when kids are squatting, there's actually like a thing you can get that's like a stool that goes around the toilet where they can stand up on a stool on either side and kind of squat over the toilet and that's also closer to what they need to do. All fours is a little harder because you can kind of see like physically what she's doing and, and that is harder to morph into a sitting position. Mm -hmm. um, you could try, you know, again, I'm just like, it becomes sort of this game of creativity. You could try like, what is it about that position? Could she sit and, you know, I don't know, push against your hands and would that simulate all fours? Or could she, you know, like try to think like, how can we be as close to what she's doing but, but not be doing what she's doing, you know? Um, and eventually get her where she's on the toilet. And people have done all kinds of, I mean, I have had families cut a hole in the back of the pull-up. Like We tried you, that, yeah. actually. <laughs> you finally get the kid on the toilet, but yeah. the, then they won't take the pull-up off. So like you cut a hole in the back and you slowly cut the back of the pull-up out until it's not there anymore. I mean, all kinds of versions of that. We tried that. that did. <laughs> so, okay, so you've done that one. But yeah, so I mean, sometimes breaking it down and thinking like, you know, what is the, as opposed to like, we're over here and we need to get over there, so we're gonna jump what is a pathway we can follow that's systematic of a bunch of baby steps to get to the point where she'll actually do it in the toilet. Um, and it can be really hard. It can take a year. I mean, it can take a long time. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you a few ideas. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I think we had a question from Everett. Do we want to? Yeah, sorry about that. No, that's okay. Okay, so, 
So my question is about timing. I have a son who will be three in October. He's going to be starting developmental preschool, and he's actually been showing some signs of readiness. Like he's been running to the potty. He's been trying to pull his diaper down, and it's hard because I would, if he wasn't starting preschool, I think I would try to start, but I'm afraid that transition will be. You know, you were talking about that stress that can happen uh -huh. with you know big changes. Yeah. So I'm, I guess I'm just curious about you know like if you know you mentioned some benchmarks of months like should I wait a certain amount of months after he starts preschool or what do I do with the signs of readiness he's showing me now like just wondering what your thoughts are kind of going yeah. forward yeah totally with that. Mm -hmm. um so I mean a, a couple things that I a couple ways that I've approached those kinds of situations so one is you can totally roll with the signs of readiness without doing the intervention. So if a child is going to the potty, if a child is taking off their diaper, if he goes to the potty, put him on the potty. You know, like just kind of roll with it and encourage everything that he's doing without necessarily doing the intervention, I think is one, you know, is one approach. You can also start doing some of the intervention to sort of lay the groundwork, like do some scheduled, you know, sitting on a normal routine or if, you know, have some reinforcers in the bathroom so that if you if he is going to the potty and you are sitting him down you can reinforce a success if it happens that kind of thing um so i think that's one component to be considered in a situation like this and this happens this is a common type of a situation um i think another component is really assessing the timing like you're saying so um how long until the child's in school He'll start October 7th. Okay. October so you, 7th is his birthday, so he'll start. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you don't have that long. So, so yeah. So probably mm -hmm. I would, I mean, unless you can like do it tomorrow, which I wouldn't advise because you're not ready and I just preached about being prepared. Um, but, you know, probably <laughs> you, you would want to wait until he adjusts because even if you were ready and you did start like this weekend, let's say, you only have a couple weeks to sort of bring those initial skills on board and then you're going to have a major transition where you might see a regression. Um, so I probably might just get him in and get him settled and like foster whatever toileting behaviors and readiness he's showing um, and mm -hmm. then sort of try to assess at what point he seems adjusted to the school setting um, and, you know, introduce it then. Now, one thing that is going to sabotage you is Christmas break <laughs> because right around the time he's right, adjusted, right. Christmas break is going to come. So that could mean and then you're exactly. looking at January. <laughs> but, you know, that's okay. Right, right. I mean, I think that's... That's an okay thing, even though you might feel like, well, he's showing all these signs of readiness, so we could, should jump on it. Because I think you can jump on it and foster whatever he is doing and also delay your intensive approach. Um, and what you might find is in the meantime, he could make a lot of progress. He could gain a lot of skills, but maybe not be quite there. And then you're just better teed up for your intensive weekend, or maybe he gets trained. I mean, I think it's hard to predict you know, what would happen. but. I think it, it's okay to wait. I mean, I think parents feel really nervous about waiting. Like, am I going to miss a window or am I going to, are we like reinforcing all these behaviors that we shouldn't be reinforcing by letting him pee in the pull up? Um, and I think you're better off to just ride that out than you are to have a poorly executed intervention. Um, so I don't know if that's a helpful couple of thoughts, but um, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. It looks like do we have one more question. Uh, I've got a question from Bellingham okay. that was re, re, that I just took over the phone. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So, we're, uh, we're so multimodal. Yeah, that's all sorts of different ways that we're getting yeah. questions answered today. So a seven-year-old, um, uh, they've been practicing the habit training for 15 months, going about every hour. Okay. Um, he fe she feels like he's not initiating in any way. So if they, you know, if somebody for some reason doesn't take him during that hour, you know, the, at that hour, the doesn't hear the alarm or something, uh, he's inevitably going to have an accident. So she feels like she's not really kind of, he's not taking it to that next step yeah. of um, being able to do it on his own. They haven't tried the positive practice. They haven't tried the pull-up underwear. Um, so she's trying, she's thinking that after listening to you, that might be something worth trying. She's yeah. wondering how many days she should try it, you know, how long to, to really kind of go for it and be consistent with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I would definitely try it. I think that's exactly where I would go with that is to add the positive practice, to get in the underwear so that the awareness is there, to make sure that the reinforcers are really consistent for, you know, for urinating in the toilet. Um, and, and I don't actually, 
in a situation like that, I don't actually think that you necessarily need to go to like a two day intensive like we've just described. I think that basically if you've already been doing it and doing the scheduled toileting and the child can pee in the toilet and that, you know, there's a good amount of progress there. I think actually what you could do is just keep doing everything you're doing and add the positive practice in and add the underwear in and maybe add the dry pants checks if those aren't happening. Um, and also um, add the communication behaviors. So in that whole chain of prompting, if the child isn't being prompted for any communication behaviors at the beginning of the chain, add that in as a goal um, so that we're programming for those communication behaviors as well. And sort of try all that for potentially a while, a month, a couple months. Um, and I probably would not go back to like an intensive weekend because if the child already knows how to pee in the toilet, it's a little bit overkill, I think. I'd probably just add those other procedures in. Yeah. So we have two more questions in here. Does that help with two more questions then we'll be good? Perfect. Um, Sounds like a plan. Hey, so I have a six-year-old daughter. Um, she's pretty much potty trained. Uh, but she really refuses to go outside of the house. Uh, yeah. She does go at school. Okay, that's good. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's more anxiety and mm -hmm. a lot of sensory issues. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have any tips. She does have a tendency to hold it. Pee. I mean, she went through periods of holding it for like 12 hours. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we kind of phased out of that, but... Yeah, that's good, because that can be a hard habit to break in and of yeah. itself. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the first thing I really like to try to do in those situations is assess as best you can why you think it's happening. Like, if it is sensory issues, what are those sensory issues? Um, are there any toilets she's more likely to go to in public than others? And can you figure out why? Which I know is hard. I mean, I'm sure you've been trying to assess it. But you could try to start like kind of keeping track, keeping some notes, um, trying like everywhere you go, try to take her to the toilet and sort of mm -hmm. even rate her resistance, you know, sort of like was it a monumental fit or was it like she squawked a little bit but you got her in there? And then what were some of the characteristics of that bathroom to sort of try to tease out maybe what some of those issues are? Um, because that's certainly going to drive your, your game plan. Um, if it's sensory, if it's like, she doesn't like the toilet flushing or it's too loud or it's too all those things we can go two directions one is to avoid you know try to avoid that sensory input and a couple obvious ways to do that i mean one is to have noise canceling headphones on when you go in the bathroom um mm -hmm. another one is to find and this gets easier these days starbucks is a good place to do this find individual bathrooms because a lot of times what's anxiety provoking for kids is multiple stalls and you can't predict when the noise is going to happen or hand dryers and someone else is out there using it while you're in the bathroom mm -hmm. um so sometimes single bathrooms are better um sometimes automatic flushers are the problem because again they're unpredictable yeah she won't go on those okay yeah so yeah. actually if you um carry sticky notes with you you can go in and cover up the automatic flusher with a sticky oh. note and then take her in so that could become a routine um automatic flushers are a disaster for kids with sensory issues you you can't predict it and when does it happen right when you sit down right it's like the worst moment possible um so so yeah that's one strategy that a parent recently told me actually is like they carry a pad of sticky dose they go in first cover up the sensor um done so 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 you can kind of go that avoidance route if you're gonna go more the route of trying to get her over it you there are interventions for getting kids you know to get used to their sensory aversions but they usually have to be really gradual and systematic kind of like the the one we were talking about with getting the child to poop in the toilet mm -hmm. so you know it's like expose her to the sound of a flusher by you know finding a youtube video of a toilet flushing and playing it a thousand times kind of thing like trying to get her used to it but it usually doesn't work to just like repeatedly go into the situation where she's fearful it's too overwhelming so you have to try to figure out approximations or like smaller versions of that so like standing outside and hearing the toilet flush inside for example or hearing it on you know on a youtube video with the volume turned almost all the way down and then slowly turn the volume up until she gets used to it um but those kind of interventions usually mm -hmm. have to be pretty systematic because what you're trying to avoid is exposing the child to the stimuli to such an extent that they become upset 
because then all they remember is I was upset. So it really was traumatic. I was right. It was traumatic. I cried or I became upset. You want to expose them to a, like a version of it that they can tolerate. So they learn mm -hmm. tolerance and sometimes figuring out what those baby steps should be to kind of work up to that is, can be challenging. Um, but that is an effective intervention. If you can figure out those, those baby steps, mm -hmm. it's pretty labor intensive. It has to be like everyday practice. Um, so it really sort of depends on really what you think the issue is and then whether you kind of want to go the like tackle it or find strategies to avoid it kind of route. <laughs> yeah, um, I think mostly she's really stubborn. I mean, we go to an OT and a lot of time I see that she needs to go, uh -huh. but she totally refuses and she wants to wait till we get home. Till you get home. And I yeah. know there are sensory issues there with the fan. But uh -huh. even if we say the fan is off, we're not turning on the light, mm -hmm. it's light outside, she totally refuses. Mm -hmm. We can argue about it for an hour there Aww. and then yeah, it's drive so home. Yeah. Have you guys tried any um, social stories? Like kind of laying out for her, like going potty at OT and, you know, visually mm -hmm. depicting like if I have to go potty at OT, it's okay, I can go. The fan is off. I won't have to hear the fan because the fan is off. Like reiterate, you know, and if I go potty at OT, then I get a reward or, you know, something that kind of like that you can repetitively review with her is sometimes useful. Even mm -hmm. if she doesn't do it the first time you show it to her, sometimes yeah. if you re do those things repetitively, you can sort of break down some of those barriers too. Um, but it's hard. I mean, sometimes you just like try all these different things and you know, it's, it's trial and error more than any like expertise that anyone has sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've tried some good things and maybe there's a few other things that I've suggested that might, you might be able yeah. to throw into the mix and see if you can, yeah, yeah get you. her there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These situations are just all tough. They're just, yeah. Last well, but not least. Okay. Well, I'm jealous for people who say their child has peed in the potty. <laughs> I have a a five-year-old and you know we stand him there we sit him down and he's never peed in the potty okay and I you know and I haven't done anything like every 20 minutes but you know if I do it very much then he he starts getting resistant to even going in uh -huh. and you know he's kind of at a point where if I tell him to go he'll go and stand but he's never actually done anything and yeah we've also tried sitting yeah. And, and we've kind of gone to sitting with him and not standing. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's probably Because good. I think it's a better choice. Yeah. Um, but he's never done anything in the potty. Yeah. And I don't, and so it's like, I don't know if, if I should try this. And if I tried it and he doesn't do it at all in the potty after two days, do I keep trying it? Or, I mean, where would yes, you? Yes, that is a very good question. When do you say, mm, maybe this isn't maybe good right there. now, especially yeah. if, he, if he starts getting upset about it, which I think he probably will. Yeah. Especially not being able to do what I, I think he knows what I want him to do. And I did have right. another son who's just a year older that was very difficult to potty train and kind of did the same pattern oh, of yeah. standing and standing and standing and not being able to pee. And finally he's doing it, yay. Yay, yeah, um, that's another but round I've, of I, But I feel like, <laughs> yeah, he had mild delays. This one's autistic and it's kind of a whole different thing also. Right. but. If I, if I, he's never peed. Yeah. Do I still yeah. just start that? And if I would I actually with resistance, then yeah. maybe back off, or do I just? So a couple things. Yeah. I mean, I the fact that he's never peed actually doesn't really matter for a program like this. Most kids who are starting a program like this have never peed in the toilet, or if they have, it's totally random and coincidental. It happened once. Um, so that's fine actually. And, and kids like that are usually good candidates for a program like this because it's the intensity that they learn from. Um, but you ask a good question about his resistance and you ask a good question about when do we stop? So with the resistance, what I would try to do is make the trips into the bathroom reinforcing as well as having reinforcers for if he does pee in the toilet. So what you can do is you can have a less, you know, exciting reinforcer for going in the bathroom and just sitting like, you know, good job sitting, here's a sticker or a less preferred food or a few minutes with your favorite book or toy or, but we still have like the really big reinforcer for if you pee in the toilet. Um, or also just like anything that makes that time reinforcing looking at books or watching iPad or singing songs or, you know, because you, you do want to try to avoid that pattern of 
resistance. I mean, you're, you're, that's a, that is a barrier for sure. So, um, but s some of those reinforcement strategies can help with that a lot. Um, when to throw in the towel is a good question that is, yeah, that's one that I should actually add onto my slides because it comes up a lot. So I don't think it's very useful to keep doing these procedures over a long period of time if they're not working. Um, three days, four days, a week at the most, and then I think we really have to evaluate. But if we are not seeing any progress or if we're seeing minimal progress after two or three days, usually I want to evaluate already. And the, the first thing I want to evaluate is are all the procedures being executed really consistently and with high degree of you know confidence that we're doing it right. Um, because that's usually the biggest pitfall is that like, you know, he's resisting a little bit and so you stop doing positive practice or you couldn't get him to drink and so now he's actually not peeing that often. So that's the, like at the end of the second day, if you haven't seen progress, the first thing I would do is really reflect on the, how you're doing with the procedures. And if you're like, no, I really think we're doing a good job with the procedures, we are executing this well, we are following the plan. Um, then I would probably do it for maybe two more days and assess again. Um, and I probably would not continue for much longer than about a week, as long as you're sure you're doing everything really well. Um, when I have patients in clinic that do this, usually what I do is I have them, we plan together, I know what weekend they're doing it, and I schedule a phone meeting with them at nine o'clock on Monday morning. <laughs> because it, you know, if it's not going well, I wanna know sooner rather than later so that we can figure out which procedures we need to troubleshoot, because usually that's the problem. Um, so I think that's you know the first thing I would do. If a child's just not benefiting, I mean, if they're if you're doing the procedures like 110 percent, like the best you know execution ever, and they're just not benefiting, then something else is obviously getting in the way. And it could be developmental level, it could be some behavioral resistance. I mean, there's other things that could be interfering, but more of something that isn't working is not necessarily better. Um, the data are the other thing that is going to be helpful because you're going to have a perception that it's not working kind of either way. <laughs> so, you know, what I usually say in terms of the data is break the day into like three hour increments, like nine, whatever time the child gets up, seven to 10, 10 to one, whatever, and track, if nothing else, track frequency of accidents and frequency of peeing in the toilet. Um, and if across those three hour increments, across several days, if you're, and sometimes even I tell, like I have families graph it when they are, work with me in clinic. Like I give them a piece of graph paper, how many accidents, you know, okay, it was five. The next day, the next three hour period, it was four, then it was three, then it was four, then it was two, then it was one, then it was two. Well, if you draw a line through that, that's a downward trend. Um, and so then I would keep going. So, so sticking close to your data is also important because you might not feel like it's getting better but that's a nice clear downward trend and i would totally keep going in that case but if it's all over the map or if it's like really just accidents that's probably when i would stop and maybe wait a few months and see if the child shows any more signs of readiness or assess what other issues might be interfering um, but the data are a good i mean if you're kind of on your own and you don't have someone you can check in with about what else should I do or should I stop? The data are a good way to make that decision. Graphing, I love the graphing part. It's a visual depiction of what's happening. It's beautiful. Okay, Thank all right. you. Thank you, Mendy. Yeah. Thank you for staying late. Thanks for sticking around, you guys. Yeah, we'll see you guys next Hopefully month. Hopefully it was helpful.